Today at the National Press Club, the president of the Tibetan government in exile, Penpa Tsering. Penpa is the political leader of the Tibetan government in exile, headquartered in northern India. Here's Penpa Tsering with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac address. My name is David Crow. I'm the Chief Political Correspondent at the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and a director here at the club. Our guest today is Penta Sering, the President of the Central Tibetan Administration based in Dharamshala in India. He is the elected head of the Tibetan government in exile. The Dalai Lama, of course, being the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people. Penta Sering took office after an election in early 2021 after a long career as a representative of the people of Tibet. He was born in a refugee camp in southern India and he studied in India and later led a group advocating for the people of Tibet in New Delhi. He was elected to the parliament in 1996 and served in that parliament for a decade before rising to the position of speaker from 2008 to 2016. And from that post, in turn, he was appointed uh, to become Tibet's representative in North America, based in Washington, D.C. So we are hearing today from a very significant figure in the future of the Tibetan people. He's also presented me with a kata here, a scarf for all occasions, I'm told, in Tibet, and a sign of welcome also. But I think it's for us to welcome Penpa Sering uh, for joining us here to talk about uh, the future of Tibet. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation on Twitter, where our handle is at Press Club Ost, or you can use the hashtag NPC. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss, and a lot to ask about. Please join me in welcoming Pempa Sering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. Uh, senators, member of the House, distinguished guest, uh, extend a very warm welcome from Dharamsala. I think the last two days have been quite sunny. The day we arrived here was quite rainy. Uh, and I hope it continues to this day. At the outset, I want to pay my respect to the Aboriginals were the uh, Aboriginals and the Torres Strait Islanders. And I'm wearing this badge today that represents the coat of arms of the Australian and the Aboriginals and the uh, Torres Strait Islanders. And I am to understand that there is going to be a referendum by the end of this year. And uh, hopefully there will be justice for the people who were custodians of this land. There are a lot of similarities between the uh, indigenous people here and the Tibet, Tibetans. Uh, maybe we can cover a little bit about that uh, later during the talk. First, uh, if I speak a little bit about the situation of Tibetans inside Tibet. Freedom House, the international watchdog, has designated Tibet as one of the least free countries alongside South Sudan. Um, and Syria. That itself uh, explains, it's not the Tibetans who are saying we are the least free country in the world. It's the international watchdog that's saying, looking at all the parameters of freedom that is there in Tibet, it's one of the least free country in the world where you have no access. No access to diplomats, no access to journalists, no access to even ordinary travelers. So that's what China tries to do, block away Tibet, make it like a huge prison uh, where nobody can go in, nobody can go out, and then tell the international community that Tibet is a socialist paradise. If Tibet is a socialist paradise, then why doesn't Chinese government allow others to see the paradise for themselves. Tibet does not have any political or civil rights. 
If anybody, if any one of you have read George Orwell's 1984, that has come into reality in China and more so in the Tibetan region, Uyghur region, Mongol region, and in Hong Kong. Tibetans inside Tibet have no political space to accept, express themselves. They have introduced what they call as the gridlock system, where action of one has to do with welfare of all your near and dear ones. If David is my friend, he lives in the capital city, Lhasa, and I come from outside. Either I live with him or I live in a hotel. If I live in a hotel, the government surveils you through electronic identification and geolocation and track your movements. If I live with David, he has to be responsible for my actions. If I take up a political activity, all of his family is going to suffer. 157 Tibetans have self-immolated so far from 2009 onwards. Most of the self-immolators are between the age of 17 to 35. They have never witnessed cultural revolution. They have, they have never witnessed independent Tibet. They only see what the Chinese government is doing to Tibet and the Tibetans today. And they are driven to this desperation of self-immolating oneself. It's not as if Chinese Tibetans cannot take up violence. Tibetans have been warriors. We have a history of expansionism in 7th to 9th century, where the Tibetan Empire extended from Xiang, the capital of China at that time, to the present-day Samarkand in Uzbekistan. But since then, since the advent of Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism into Tibet, Tibetans have mellowed down. We have become deeply religious. We remained nonviolent and peaceful. We didn't even have a standing army when Chinese started invading us from the east. And uh, Chamdo was taken over in so short a time that nobody expected this would be done in so short a time. So political space does not exist in Tibet whatsoever. No access to Tibet. No free flow of information. If you are caught sending any information out of Tibet, you go to jail. If you receive any information from outside, still keep it to yourself, you're safe. But if you redistribute those information, then you have to go to jail. There's no other way. So that is the status, political uh, freedom in Tibet. Now, when it comes to religion, the number of monks and nuns that were there in independent Tibet has now come down drastically. Management of monks of the monastic institutions now have been taken over by multiple agencies of the state security and the United Work Front. Tibetan monks and nuns are no more responsible for the management of monks and of the monasteries. CCTVs are put in all the monasteries to surveil the movement of monks and nuns. Chinese government, who does not believe in religion, sets up curriculum of Buddhist studies inside Tibet. Since 2007, the Chinese government issued what is now known as Order Number no. 5, whereby the Chinese government is now responsible for recognition of reincarnated lamas, or what they call as living Buddhas. This is aimed at the 15th Dalai Lama. China is not bothered about the living 14th Dalai Lama, but they are more bothered about the 15th Dalai Lama as to how to control the 15th Dalai Lama and through the 15th Dalai Lama, the Tibetan people. My message to the Chinese government is, have you not learned enough lesson from the Pension Lama saga, where the 10th Pension Lama was in a way murdered by the Chinese government after his visit to Australia at that time, returning back to Tibet. There was no post-mortem done on his body, but there were a lot of signs of him being poisoned. Died in 89. There were search parties looking for his reincarnation. The message came through to Dharamsala. His Holiness selected 
Kendi Chujima as the next Benjamin Lama. And since then, the six-year-old boy, way back in 1985, disappeared. The Chinese government took him and his family. We still don't know whether he's alive or not. Even if he's alive, whether he has been given the traditional education to carry on his responsibilities or not. There have been a lot of requests from the international community about his whereabouts and his safety, or whether he's living or not. There's been no response from the Chinese government except from the fact that he's studying and he doesn't want to be disturbed. That being the case, the Chinese pension lama is not recognized by the Tibetans inside Tibet. If you go to Tibet, you will not find the picture of Chinese select pension lama to be sold on the market. Of course, you won't have pictures of his holiness selection. They only sell pictures of the 10th pension lama to show their displeasure to the Chinese government that they do not recognize the Chinese selected pension lama. Chinese government tried to use their selected pension lama to influence the neighboring Buddhist countries. They sent him to Hong Kong. They sent him to Thailand. They tried to send him to Nepal last year. We found out, managed to block that. Then the only other places, perhaps, that the Chinese government can force other governments to receive pension lama, maybe Mongolia, or the Russian republics. Right now, they have good relation, China and Russia. Russian republics of Tuva, Buryat, and Kalmykia. But all these people who practice Tibetan Buddhism have faith and trust and loyalty to His Holiness. So there's no respect for the pension lama selected by the Chinese government. And if and when a time comes to look for the 15th Dalai Lama, there will be two Dalai Lamas. So it's not going to be an instance where the Chinese government can send its army and then quell it and get done away with. This is going to be a lifelong problem. So does the Chinese government want a lifelong headache on their hand or not? It's something that Chinese government can chew on, something to think about. Freedom of monks and nuns to move is also a big problem. They need at least four or five different permits to move from one place to another. They have to show their permits at every check post they have set up. And particularly to go into Tibet Autonomous Region is very troublesome. So this is the state of religious affair in Tibet. Successive Chinese presidents from Mao Zedong to now, except for a brief period during Deng Xiaoping and Hu Yaobang in the early 80s, all the policies and programs, particularly during President Xi Jinping's time, has been tightened. All the laws, regulations that they amend are aimed at more tightening and control over the Tibetan population. Every artificial intelligence mechanisms are used to control the Tibetans, whether it be artificial, uh, whether it be electronic identification, geolocation that we talked about, or the collection of, or the DNA profiling of the Tibetans. We don't know what they're going to do with that. Of course, they do it in the name of national security and social stability. We also know that one Chinese scientist had managed to change DNA of people. Maybe if they change all the DNA of all the Tibetans, maybe another 10, 20, 30, down, 30 years down the line, they can claim that there was never ever a Tibetan race that is separate from the Chinese race. And the Chinese government is also collecting iris samples of Tibetan people. We also don't know how they're going to use that against the people, but they are doing that without consent of the people. They are collecting DNA samples of even small children, even visitors. If a Tibetan Australian here visits Tibet, they will collect blood samples and they will profile their DNA and iris. So that is the level of control of the Chinese government. And right now, they are striking at the very identity of the Tibetan people in terms of language. Because language is the foundation of Tibetan Buddhist culture. Many people might believe that Tibetan language might have something to do with Chinese language. It has nothing to do with Chinese language. 
the Tibetan language came from India in 7th century. Tibetan Buddhism also came from India in, seventh century, in 8th century. And the first Tibet, uh, the Indian Pandit who came to Tibet told the Tibetan emperor that since you have your own language, why don't you translate every available Sanskrit text into Tibetan instead of him teaching Sanskrit to the Tibetans? So we must have had the biggest transliteration house in the world in 8th century where we translated every available Sanskrit into Tibetan. And we are proud to be a repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom, which is now in the form of Tibetan Buddhist culture. And that is manifested in the message of His Holiness the Dalai Lama of love, peace, compassion in this world. Now, the Chinese government has started these boarding schools. Over the last one decade, they have been moving, removing Tibetan children from their homes into the boarding schools, according to Tibet Action Institute and the UN Special Rapporteur's report about a million Tibetan children out of seven million Tibetans are in colonial-style boarding schools. Now, I'm sure that will remind you of the stolen generation of the Australians from 1910 to 1970, where the Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders suffered because of those policies. When we point that out to the Chinese government, they point fingers at the United States and say, how did the United States treat, treat its own native people? Or the Canadians with their First Nation people, or the Australians with the Aboriginals, even the Scandinavians with the Sami people. Which means to say that China knows that these governments have done wrong. We all know that all these governments have done wrong, but they are trying to make up for what they did. But Chinese government is knowingly, deliberately doing this to the Tibetans. At one time, I used to fear demographic aggression from China, a complete sinicization, a complete majority, a majority community completely overwhelming a minority community. Of course, we are not against education. We need education for Tibetan people. We are not against bilingualism also. So Tibetans classes, it's only four classes in a week. Now, just about a week or two ago, we received information from inside Tibet that China has now introduced. This is exactly what they used to do. Anytime they introduce a new policy, they sample it in a smaller place, and then they replicate that on a larger scale. So according to information that was coming through from Tibet, in the Kanze Tibetan prefecture, which borders with China, from 2024 20, onwards, there will be no more Tibetan classes in middle school. If they succeed in that, they, they will implement that in whole of Tibet. And if this continues for another decade or two, then there will be severe consequences on Tibetans being able to maintain their identity. And we, as I said before also, the Tibetan Buddhist culture has something to offer to this world. We expected this 21st century to be a much more peaceful world. People are much more educated, economically much better. But we are witnessing so many hotspots of violence around the world. And we want to set an example of peaceful re resolution of conflicts. We have always resorted to 911 violence as a means, and His Holiness has been very categorical in his statements that if Tibetans take up violence, I will no more be responsible for the cause of Tibet. So it's not, as I mentioned before, also it's not like Tibetans cannot take Chinese life, but they are not taking it. They are resisting from that. They are practicing peace, and they are burning themselves to death, hoping against hope that the Chinese government will pay some attention to their plight or hoping against hope that the international community will come to their rescue, but to no avail as of today. But I keep reassuring my people that in such a peaceful movement like Tibet, these are accumulations of actions, and all their sacrifices will not go in vain. It will have its results in the end. But when you follow nonviolence, it's a more difficult path. It takes longer time. 
but that is the only means to resolve conflicts because violence begets more violence. If you take up violence, there's never going to be an end. It's going to be a cycle of violence. And that is not what humanity needs. Everybody wants happiness. His Holiness always stresses on the oneness of humanity. And if political leaders understand this concept of the oneness of humanity and the interdependence of the nature of our ex existence, then there will be more peace in this world. Now, speaking about the importance of Tibet, geostrategically, Tibet is very important for the whole region. It's in the heart of Asia. The size of Tibet is about 2.5 million square kilometers, almost one-third of Australia. We call ourselves the land surrounded by snow mountain ranges. Because of these range of snow mountain ranges, the Himalayas in the south, the Karakoram in the west, the Kunlun in the north, and a series of mountain ranges in the east. Tibet was impenetrable for many. From 16th century onwards to 20th century, you can count the number of Westerners who came to Tibet. There are not too many. I've had the occasion to read many of the travelogues of this uh, travelers to Tibet. So we remained isolated on that plateau for many centuries, not having much relation with the outside world. And we were happy being there on our own, practicing Buddhism and living a sustainable way of life. Now all these things are being threatened. The Western world started calling Tibet the roof of the world because of its altitude. Australia is surrounded by sea. Tibet is landlocked. The density of population, I think, is quite similar. It's in 2.5 million square kilometers, we are only 7 million. In Australia, in 7.6 million square kilometers, you are 25 million. So the reason why they call it the roof of the world is because I checked the highest mountain in Australia, that's about 7,000 feet above sea level. <laughs> I was speaking to Japanese students and I asked them, which is the biggest mountain in your area? And they said Mount Fuji. And what's the altitude? 3,700, 800 meters above sea level, equivalent to about 12,000 feet above sea level. And I said, that is like base camp in Tibet. So because of Tibet's altitude, it's called the roof of the world. Now, Asians call Tibet the water tower of Asia. You have rivers that originate from Tibet, go into India, like the Sutlej and the Indus, going into Pakistan. And Indus is the cradle of Indus Valley civilization. The two major rivers that flow into China, the Yangtze and the Yalo, originate from Tibet and yellow is the cradle of Chinese civilization. So two major civilization are based on rivers that originate from Tibet. And if it's not for Yangtze and Yalo, China would not exist today. We already heard reports about Yangtze going down by half last summer. We have to watch this year what happens. There was hydroelectricity production stopped, navigation also stopped. That could, that's the impact. Way back in 1998, there was a huge flood on the Yangtze, which destroyed many lives and properties. Since then, China has been giving some attention to Tibetan ecological and environmental situation, but not enough. Rivers that originate from Tibet flow into Nepal. The Brahmaputra that flows from Tibet flows into India and Bangladesh. China today is building a dam twice the size of three gorges, which is the biggest in the world. So one can imagine how much land is going to be inundated upstream and how much flora, unique flora and flora that abounds that region is going to be decimated. And the Himalayas came into being because of the tectonic shift between the Asian plates and the Gondwana plates, and scientists still say that Himalaya is growing and it's one of the most seismic zones in the world. If something happens to the size of that kind of a dam at the Great Bend, when the Brahmaputra takes a U-turn to come into India, 
then what will happen to all the people downstream? I was in Arunachal Pradesh last year, last year end, and the chief minister of the state was kind enough to send me a helicopter to travel around. And when you see from the helicopter all the tributaries that join the Brahmaputra, pristine, clear water, and the river that's coming out from Tibet is very muddy, and this has not been going on for the last two, three days, or three, two, three months. This has been going on since 2018. So one can imagine the scale of construction going on on the Brahmaputra inside Tibet that will have devastating effect on downstream countries. Rivers that originate from Tibet also flow into Burma, like the Irrawaddy or the Salween or the Mekong that flows into Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam, five countries in Southeast Asia, some of the most densely populated around uh, areas in the world. So some estimate that out of 8 billion people, between 1 to 1.8 to 2 billion people have something to do with waters, rivers that originate from Tibet. So we are talking about, when I talk to some of our audiences, I tell them we are political refugees today, but there will be a lot more environmental refugees if China continues the way it does, because it does not share any hydrological data with any of its downstream countries. Forget about sharing water. There's no water sharing agreement with any of its East countries. And these countries are not able to speak up to the Chinese government right now. You have the Mekong River Commission is working on it. There are so many stories of downstream countries losing their livelihood because of the impact of damming series of dams in Tibet, in, in Tibet by the Chinese government. And then you have the upstream countries also damming up. And then all the downstreams have serious problems. But if there's too much water, they let it flow. They use Tibet like a tap. If there's too much water, they let it flow. They have flood in the downstream countries. If there's less water, they stop it. Then they drop in the downstream countries. So we are talking about serious food security and water security issues in this region. Some say that third world war could happen because of water, whether that happens because of water or not, but water is essential for people to live. That's the importance of Tibet's environment. Today, Chinese environmental scientists call Tibet as the third pole because of the amount of glaciers and permafrost that feeds all these major rivers. The UN a body on climate change say that apart from the North Pole and South Pole, where the ice are melting three times the speed of a normal, on Tibet, the ice melt is twice the speed of average melting of ice. And if all these ice melt, if all these glaciers melt on Tibet, we could have serious problem with methane emanating out of the permafrost that has been inside the uh, earth for so long, and it may not, Tibet may become unlivable even for Tibetans. And then all the downstream country, countries will not have any of these perennial rivers that they have. They will ha always have to depend on rainwater, which is also now because of climate change uh, posing serious problems on monsoons. Even the jet streams that flow over the Tibetan plateau has impact on the flow uh, on the onset of monsoon in the whole region, whether it's southeast monsoon or southwest monsoon. So these are serious. There are some serious implications if Tibetan uh, ecology and environment is not cared for. Destruction on Tibet's environment, fragile environment, could be irreversible, and in many cases. So this is the strategic importance of Tibet environmentally for the whole region. That's why it does not concern only Tibet. And geostrategically and geopolitically, Tibet has always played the role of a buffer between the two most populous nations in the world, China and India, because of its size. Now, we feel we have the potential to play the role of a bridge between the two most populous nations in the world if we manage to resolve the Sino-Tibet conflict through the middle way policy. China's 
belligerence on Indian border, China's all-weather friendship with Pakistan just to contain India are creating a lot of problems in the region, security issues. That is why His Holiness decided to think about the middle way approach as early as 1973-74. And when I say 1973-74, this was the period at the height of cultural revolution, on the throes of cultural revolution where everything old was destroyed, old was being destroyed in the whole of China and more so in Tibet. Thousands of Tibetan monasteries were destroyed. Many Tibetans died as a direct or indirect result of Chinese occupation. So in future, if the Sino-Tibet conflict could be resolved through the middle way approach or the policy in a non-violent way, then there could be more peace in the whole region. There could be better relations between China and Tibet uh, and India where we can be the intermediary. Uh, th then, of course, the political situation, all the countries keep saying that Tibet is part of China at the behest of Chinese government. Now, when I reach out to the international community, I tell them, if you keep this, repeating this statement that Tibet is part of People's Republic of China, you are going against international law, because we have only one agreement with People's Republic of China, 17-point agreement. That was also forced upon us. After the occupation of Chamdo, militarily by the Chinese government, and under international law, this agreement should be null and void. It is the same international law, whether it's now happening now or 70 years before, whether it's happening to Ukraine now or it happened to Tibet 70 years back. So Tibet should not be an exception in the implementation of international law. It should be applied to everybody. And then countries keep saying at the behest of the Chinese government that Tibet is part of PRC, and then also say that they support negotiation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Chinese government. Well, we tell them these two don't go together, it contradicts each other. Because Chinese government rules China with an iron hand and then the whole international community keeps repeating this statement that Tibet is part of PRC, then where is the reason for China to come and talk to us? So that is why I reach out to the international community and ask them to recognize Tibet's historical status as an independent state. By saying that, I don't mean to say that we are asking for independence from China we still follow the middle way approach proposed by His Holiness Dalai Lama and approved by the Tibetan parliament in exile. We remain committed to this in a non-violent way. But at the same time, if there is no recognition for the independent status of Tibet as an independent state, then there's no reason for China to come to talk to us. Mr. President, could I ask a follow-up question on that? Sure. That concept, that's a central issue now in deciding the... Uh, the future of the Tibetan people, uh, because I've, I've seen you say that, that um, in fact, one of your comments was some countries think that if you support Tibet, then you are against China, which is not the case, because we are not asking for independence. But of course, you are asking for a, a form of independence, but is it not full independence from China? Could you explain the difference between you know, separate statehood and independence? The middle way approach, uh, as proposed by His Holiness, uh, is a Buddhist concept, uh, avoiding extreme polarities. So one polarity is the status of Tibet, historical status as an independent state, and the other polarity is the present situation of Tibet under the repressive government of the CPC. So wherein we are trying to seek a solution of an autonomous arrangement whereby Tibetans will have the freedom to practice its language, protect its environment, you know, and preserve its culture and religion and language. So these are basic fundamental rights which are taken for granted in the free world that does not exist in Tibet. So this is what we are asking for. We are not asking for independence. Even the 
they, they even here at the press club, we know that Chinese government, uh, the ambassador here, asked the press club to disinvite me. And I always thank the Chinese government for being our best publicity agent. <laughs> So we are not asking, this should not be misunderstood, because His Holiness has been chanting like a mantra, autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. Of course, in Tibet, they call it Tibet Autonomous Region, Tibet Autonomous Prefecture, Tibet an Autonomous County, but there's no autonomy in real sense. That is why we are asking for genuine autonomy or meaningful autonomy. We have studied autonomous arrangements around the world. And there are cases like South Tyrol or Scotland where autonomy is at a higher level. And if those kind of autonomies are granted to the Tibetans, Tibetans will be happy to live under the framework of the People's Republic of China's constitution. It's not a matter of who rules. It's the quality of the rule. That is why now even in China also, Internationally, do you see too many cases where one country invades another country and say this is part of us, or you ask the whole international community to say this is part of us? But in China, you have, even in China, you don't say Chinese government is not asking Australian government to say Manchuria is part of China, or uh, uh, Mongolia is part of China, or East Turkestan is part of China. Why only Tibet? Because Chinese government knows that they have no legitimacy of their rule over Tibet. That is why they are trying to seek this legitimacy from the international community. But who is the international community to decide for us? When we lived on that plateau for so many centuries, neighboring countries decided for us, Russia decided for us, China decided for us, British India decided for us. Now we are in exile also, the international community is deciding for us. So my question is to the government is the history cannot be decided by whims and fancies of political leaders. It has to be based on facts. And that's why we reach out to the international community in the manner put some sense into what they are saying, not just repeat like a parrot as to what Chinese government want you to say. We will have, uh, I'm sure, some questions on sure. that topic. And so we'll... we'll... <laughs> and our first question is from Andrew Tillett. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your appearance, uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review, and also a board member here at the Press Club. Um, you just mentioned about the Chinese government being your best publicity agent, but it, it seems like the the Tibetan cause is probably doesn't attract the the international attention it, it once did. You think back in the '90s, where a lot of celebrities, um, uh, rock stars, things like that, were behind sort of the Free Tibet movement and things like that. Um, I went to one concert in the 90s, a free event to concert, for instance. Um, but other, other sort of concerns with China are sort of overtaking that. You know, we talk about now about things like Xinjiang, the erosion of democracy in Hong Kong. Um, from an Australian perspective, our, our trade um, sanctions on our economic coercion. Um, what do you th feel you need to do to get the sort of the Tibetan... Um, cause, I guess, back in the in, in the in the forefront. I mean, it's, it, do you feel it has sort of been supplemented by other issues, and it's sort of fallen off as the um, as a priority for international attention? I think for the international community and for international media also, wherever there is violence, they pay more attention. I don't understand that. Wherever there are peace movements, that also should be promoted because this is what we need. Because there will be a lot of problems in this life. There will be a lot of challenges. There will be a lot of disagreements around the world. But if everybody takes up violence, thinking that violence gets covered in international press or violence gets attention by the governments, then I think this is a totally wrong approach. So just because you don't hear about what is happening inside Tibet, that is what Chinese government is doing exactly. They, they don't allow you to come into Tibet. They don't let you see for yourself what is happening. And they make sure that it goes out of public memory. And they think that because of their propaganda, their propaganda is so strong and pervasive that the whole international community may be thinking that Tibet must have been part of China since time immemorial, as China says, or since antiquity. But then I think 
just because you don't have access to information inside Tibet, that doesn't mean to say that we are not having problem inside Tibet. What we are saying is we are dying a slow death culturally, day by day, day by day. It's like a boa python strickening us all the time out of our breath every single day. So it's policies after policies that are directed at destroying the very identity of the Tibetan people. It's, and if you want more, if attention can be garnered only through, only through violence, then are you advising the Tibetans to take up violence? Or are the international community wants the Tibetans to take up violence? Is that the only way to get attention about the Tibetan case? Cause? And even the Chinese government keeps saying, oh, Dalai Lama is a separatist. Now they call me also a separatist. And His Holiness has always been chanting autonomy like a mantra. Now Chinese government calls us, now who really wants Tibet to be separated from China? Is it the Chinese government or the Tibetan people? So all these needs to be looked into. And I think if there can be more investigative journalism, now you have a lot more avenues not just through the conventional means of getting news, but then many other sources of getting news if international community also gives some attention to what is going on there. And it's our job also to reach out to governments and tell them what's happening. And some of the members present here, the senators and house members, they've been to Dharamsala and their engagement in the house yesterday in both houses were very, very encouraging for us. You know, these are signs that there are people who are still willing to listen to us, even after 63 years in exile. I know some kind of fatigue gets developed uh, over, over time because they think that oh, there is no solution to that. But we have never lost hope. Tibetans inside Tibet has never lost hope, even after 63 years. Chinese government always fail to understand the aspiration of the people. They always think that for every challenge, every problem, development, development, development is the solution. They can't think about anything else. When it comes to Tibet, uh, I hear about conversations in the upper excellence of Chinese government. Oh, we put so much money in Tibet. Why are Tibetans making so much noise? We are not only looking for material. We are not against development also. But again, development for whom? All this rail net. By 2030, Tibet is going to be linked in many ways from Chindu to Lhasa to you know, Yunnan to Lanto uh, with all this Kormol, Lhasa, Shigatse Railway already in plans. Then you have the uh, Pakistan-China corridor coming up. All these developments are going to be detrimental for Tibet's environment. We should, uh, we should go to the next question at this yes. point, I think, Mr. President. Uh, it's from Stephen Jettis. Hello, sir. Thank you for your speech today. Um, can I just ask about your relationship with your host, the, uh, the Government of India? Uh, have you noticed a substantial shift in India's engagement with your government in exile uh, or a shift in its attitude towards you? in the wake of the increasing tensions between New Delhi and Beijing, in particular in the wake of the extensive border clashes that we've seen between the two countries. Has that dynamic shifted in any way? And what impact, if any, has it had on your ties with New <coughs> Delhi? When His Holiness is asked this question, His Holiness used to say, for India, when it comes to China, India is always overcautious. Now I can say we can remove the over, but still cautious. So because of China's belligerence on Indian border, India has become much more stronger. And that is what I keep telling all the countries. If there is one thing that we know as Tibetans having lived with the Chinese for so many centuries, is to stand up for your values. If you don't stand up for your values and position, Chinese will always use you like a pony. They'll keep riding you. Uh, so now, because of the belligerent China's belligerence on the Indian border, I've been to these, two, uh, for, to these places in Ladakh, in Tawang. The Tawang incident happened just after I left from Tawang, about two weeks after I left Tawang. Not even a blade of grass grows on the land where uh, China is fighting over territory in Ladakh. Uh, so why this belligerence again? 
So with Indian government, we have a very transparent relationship. If it is not for the government of India, we would not be where we are today. But there are, of course, relations and ebbs and flows in our relationship. And now, of course, with China's belligerence on the Indian border, we work very closely at every level, just like India is working very closely with Australia and Japan with new formations like AUKUS and Quad. China, India is taking a much more stronger position, saying that if there is no disengagement from all sectors, there won't be normalization of relations. So uh, I, I really appreciate India's strong position after Prime Minister Modi came in. Because and we are uh, limited for time, we may go to the next question now, and the next question is yeah. from Matthew Knott. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sering. Uh, you've called for uh, the Australian government to uh, impose sanctions on China because of uh, human rights abuses. What would you say to any Australians watching at home or even people uh, within the Albanese government who say that China is Australia's biggest trading partner? Uh, it would be too detrimental to relations between Australia and China to take such an action. If it's the foreign policy of the Australian government to impose sanctions on governments that commit crimes against humanity, just like what China is doing inside Tibet in terms of boarding schools, these are crimes against humanity. I know, we know for a fact that the Australian government has sanctioned Iran, Burma, Russia. When it comes to China, then everybody calls down a little bit. So that need not necessarily be the case. If it is a foreign policy, then it has to be equal for everybody, whether it's a big country or a small country. Of course, there are national interests involved. So one has to be very strategic, but at the same time, one has to be very forthright in their position. If you want to apply a Magnitsky law, then why not to all other countries? Why some countries are exception and some countries? That is the feeling when the poorer countries, the smaller countries, where everybody feels they can, you know, call them down, they implement Magnitsky, they implement sanctions, and that when it comes to bigger countries, they get away with everything. That does not help. The next question is from Pablo Vinales. Thank you so much for your time. Pablo Vinales from SBS. I also wanted to ask about Magnitsky sanctions. Our foreign minister was asked about this uh, just a few months ago, and she said that uh, Australia's foreign policy sanctions are part of uh, the solution when it comes to raising concerns around human rights. Um, do you accept that explanation? And do you fear this uh, kind of um, stabilisation of relations between China uh, and Australia will come at the expense of Tibet's cause? <clears throat> I cannot justify for the Australian government, or I cannot uh, uh, say this is wrong, because there are a lot of interests. There are many things that we know. There are many things that we don't know how things are being handled. But I think everybody is very clear. Everybody knows who is doing what. Chinese government is very clear. They know what Australia is doing with Japan or in the Quad or the uh, AUKUS formations. And, to, the, and why is the reason for, China, for Australia to be part of all these formations? It's because of China's assertiveness in the region. They need, Australia also needs to be protected. Also Australia, tomorrow, just like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, if tomorrow China invades Australia, Australia needs its friends. So we do understand the sensitivities involved when it comes to uh, China, and there are also a lot of national interests involved. And Australia is in a very unique position where you have trade surplus with China alongside New Zealand and very few countries that have that. So when we reach out, we always tell them, that please don't look at us from the perspective of a victim of communism. If you, look, you, can, if you can look at us as partners in bringing about positive changes in China, because nobody wants anarchy in China. That's going to have severe consequences to the whole global economy. So there has to be a guidance guiding China in the right direction. And we are the internal forces if we have to bring about positive changes in China. Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, Manchus, Hong Kongers, even the Taiwanese. So it depends on how strategically you work with partners uh, to take China in the right direction. That would be more useful 
then maybe not necessarily sanctions all the time because there are many ways you can work around things. Uh, but then it has to be very, very strategic uh, from every country that deals with China. Our next question is from Melissa Code. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, in some ways, some of the analogies you referenced in your speech to the situation in Ukraine and also Australia's First Nations people and the experience of the Tibetans conveys a sense that Tibet's story is everybody's story, including in the sense that what happens um, to water resources is very important for the geostrategic interests of um, Southeast Asia. So in that vein, um, two questions. One, when was the last time some of your representatives were able to speak with Chinese officials? How did that conversation go? What is the outlook for future talks with them? Um, and two, what broader macro lessons can the world and humanity learn about the tension you describe between the um, Buddhist middle way approach and the development economic interests that tend to dominate so many um, international relations negotiations? The second question first, uh, I think there is no uh, paradox in this. Uh, it can go together with this notion in economic development. Buddhists are not saying we are going to sit in one cave and don't want any material, material development. We also need material development. Uh, everybody needs material development. But then for us, spiritual development, development of the heart and the mind is more important it's just for us, it's enough to get one plate of food to survive. You don't need all these paraphernalia that creates more consumerism in this world where you consume so much and then you land up in a lot of problems of unsustainability of resources. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean to say that it has to be opposite of uh, opposite positions. Uh, the last time there were dialogue between China and Tibet was between 2002 and 2010. And that was, we now know that China, China has taken us for a ride because when China bid for Olympics in 2000, 2001, that was around the same time that China also had free trade agreement with China, America. And America put this rider, rider to have a congressional executive commission on China with a bipartisan, a bicameral uh, commission that looks into the human rights situation inside China. So even with the case of Australia, we don't appreciate bilateral human rights dialogues because that is something that they keep saying, oh, we raise this, we raise that, but that doesn't help. It does not produce any result. So uh, since then, since 2010, there has been no traction on the dialogue. And right now, yes, there are back channels, but I can't go into the details right now whether because I always say on administrative matters, I'm 100% transparent. But when it comes to China, uh, we will be very careful. We, we, we will take only one step at a time. And from a high-level perspective in terms of the relationship with China and the back-level um, back dialogues, have you seen any change in the time since there was a change from the Trump to the Biden administration? That does not necessarily reflect uh, the situation from uh, Trump to Biden, but uh, we do hear some rumblings from Beijing, but uh, I can't expand uh, over and above that. As things happen, you will know. Thank you. And the next question is from William Tong. Uh, thank you so much for your spe speech. Uh, William Ton from the Australian Associated Press. Um, just following up on that previous question, um, China has increasingly been belligerent uh, in, um, in its stance towards uh, Taiwan reunification. Um, what hopes do you have for your plight uh, through the middle way approach if China is uh, increasingly trying to regain more control? Yeah, right now it doesn't look very likely that there's too, there's too much scope for middle way policy, but then they know our position. From 2002 to 2010, we have conveyed every single position of our in written to the Chinese government, so they know what we are talking about. And uh, the back channels indicate that there might be some willingness, but then uh, beyond that, uh, I can't speak. But then I want to take this opportunity also to say that China is very insecure today. 
uh, why do they keep these flashpoints burning, whether it's with India or the Spratlys or the Sankaku with Japan or the saber rattling with Taiwan or the assertiveness in South China Sea. Uh, if there is a threat to the survival of the Communist Party, then they will definitely attack one of these places. Till such a time, I don't see China having the guts to venture into militarism in the area because what really matters for China is the economy. And right now, it's taking a downturn. We already know about 11.6 million educated young Chinese who doesn't have job uh, now being asked to go to the villages and work just like what Mao used to do during his time, Xi Jinping is doing the same thing. So China is very insecure today. So we have to keep uh, watching the dynamism and see, because my analysis is that if there is a threat to the survival of the Communist Party, then they will definitely attack one of these places. Because if there is no Communist Party, there is no trade, there is no international relations. And that is what Xi Jinping is concerned about. And all the sound bites that is coming out of China right now is security, 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 security. And the president of China also tries to instill this kind of fear that foreigners are now up against us, that everybody is ganging up. So when you talk about history, when, we, when they talk about history, if when they like the Manchus and the Mongols are also Chinese. When they don't like, then Manchus and Mongols are aggressors against the Chinese people. So it depends on their interpretation of how they want to do it. But we believe in impermanence. We believe things will change. Things has to change. And maybe all power in the hands of Xi Jinping will accelerate that change. Our next question is from Julie Hare. Hello, thank you for your speech. Julie here from the Australian Financial Review. I'm also the education editor there, so I was very interested in your um, comments around the boarding schools. Um, I'd kind of make the comment that education can be as powerful as war. Um, so I just would like your interpretation of what the intention of the CPC, um, Xi's um, intentions to re-educate the Tibetan people, um, other than holding the same views as the CPC propaganda, is it to train Tibetan people to be warriors or to rewrite Chinese history, which has been the, those parts of it that have been rooted in Tibetan culture, or is it to just write off Tibetan culture? Unfortunately, when the whole world is moving towards multiculturalism, mm -hmm. China wants to move towards one culture, one nation, one culture, one language. So they impose use of Mandarin and they are not even used to, uh, Cantonese is even discouraged to use. Forget about Tibetans and Uyghur language and Mongolian language. But that is very unfortunate. I don't know what is going on in Xi Jinping's head. Sometimes I get this feeling that maybe we should get him to Australia, do a surgery on his head and put some common sense <laughs> and send him back. Doesn't make sense because People are people. They have their roots, they have their heritage, they have their culture, which they are very proud about. And when you strike there, then it hurts people. Then people rebel. And it's not going to work. Everything that the Chinese government is doing to make people angry, even Chinese themselves are saying, this is going to be the last generation. We are not going to have any kids because there is no freedom in China. You know, so it's not just the Tibetan people. Chinese people are suffering. Uh, so this is aimed at complete eradication of the uh, identity of the nationalities so that everything becomes Chinese. Uh, everything, even in to, to, every time they call it with Chinese characteristics. Some people don't know even religion with Chinese characteristics. Now, we have been having debates as to what does Chinese government mean by that. And some understand that as changing the shape of the building. So if it's a Tibetan monastery in Beijing, they change the shape of the building to say, oh, now this is Buddhism with Chinese characteristic. But Tibetan Buddhism has nothing to do with the shapes of the building. It has everything to do with the mind and the teaching, the learnings of Buddha's teachings. You know, so at one time, we were very afraid of, uh, um, as I mentioned before, I'm very apprehensive about uh, Chinese demographic aggression. It's happening. The Chinese are moving only to in those areas where they can make money, not they don't go to the rural areas because they can't make money. Uh, 
but uh, uh, it's not happening as much as we feared because the Chinese population itself is going down. And then Chinese will also need that lung to live on the Tibetan plateau. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that is why the, now they try to cynicize everything. That's why when you ask questions about Xinjiang, I don't like to use that word Xinjiang. Well, it's a name given by the Chinese government to the Uyghurs, or the East Turkestanis. And that's how they change. They cynicize everything. Now if you look on Google map, I cannot find out which place is what, because it's all in Chinese. They have even renamed some parts of Arunachal Pradesh in India in Chinese. So that's how they cynicize from name of countries, names of places to people thinking. And they think they can do it. But this is an impossible job. And if they try to force it upon the people, then people are going to rise up. And that's not going to be good for them. Our next question is from Nick Stewart. You make that point about China very strongly. I was wondering if you feel the same way about India, where you're currently based. Uh, Modi has, of course, been particularly identified with Hinduism, and as a result of that, there has been a great deal of concern uh, from uh, so-called minority uh, religions like the Muslims in India. Are you concerned about not simply China but other countries as well, and the increasing hom homogeneity of, uh, and, and the way they insist there is only one religion that can be acceptable in any one country? Maybe because of certain incidences, uh, people construe it that way. But we live in India. I was born in India. We lived there. It's not as drastic as it's being made out in the international uh, media about Modi's course of policies of turning. He's not trying to change Muslims into Hindus. But there are some cow vigilantes that are overreacting to a certain situation and that the governments get blamed for it. But I think India is one of the most tolerant countries in this world because they have a very diverse culture, so many religions, so many different kind of people. Of course, as His Holiness says, troublemakers are there everywhere. Just because of few troublemakers, you can't blame the whole community. And I think India is a very resilient country that uh, takes in uh, the diversity of, and they take pride in the diversity of their existence of so many different cultures and religions. Thank you. I, do, do you see the troublemakers as on the Hindu side or the Muslim side? Could be both. <laughs> it's there from both the communities. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Tim Shaw. Uh, thank you, David. Excellency, Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press. You have to pull it up more. You're so tall. At nearly two. Thank you for this gift today, and thank you for your speech here at the National Press Club. Recently, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives were welcomed to better understand the work of Tibetan uh, people in Dar es Salaam. In health and education, what gift can Australia give in terms of educating the future leaders of Tibet, whether it be in health policy and education, as you have outlined today, uh, borders are challenged. Governments set policy. But what is the gift of education and health that Australians can give the Tibetan people? Uh, coming here um, last Saturday uh, to Sydney and now here in Canberra, Today evening we'll be in Melbourne and then to Brisbane. Uh, not able to visit some of the smaller Tibetan communities here. But I sense that there is a lot of support from the Australian government, the local authorities, the elected membership. And uh, uh, we were in Dr. Sophie's place. Uh, she will also be, uh, uh, I think, attending His Holiness' birthday uh, this coming week uh, in her constituency. So, there is a lot of support. I even thank the principal of the school who provides all these facilities for the weekend Tibetan classes in Sydney, and they are doing a wonderful job. Now, as, uh, and we are really thankful to the Australian government for the ongoing immigration program, uh, because of which some 2,169 Tibetans are already here through that proce uh, process. And there were another 300, 400 Tibetans. So I think right now it's about 2,500 to 600 Tibetans in the whole of Australia. Uh, but there is no any developmental aid for the Tibetans uh, from the Australian government. So this is one issue that we discussed with some of our friends in the parliament. 
uh, in the possibilities of the Australian government being able to support us for education or rehabilitation so the Tibetans in India, Nepal and Bhutan where we face challenges. Tibetans who came over from Tibet in the last 30, 40 years into India and Nepal don't own anything. They don't have an inch of land. They get some employment, but much of the rent, their rent goes for, uh, uh, much, much of their salary goes for rent. And we are, we are now we have developed a program called Building Back Compact Communities in India, Nepal, and Bhutan, where we have the challenge of dispersing Tibetan community. Most of youths are going out, those who can give birth to people uh, and have productive labor are moving out. So we have to get more people into the compact community. It's because of the compact communities that we managed to preserve our language, our cultural institutions, monastic institutions that were destroyed inside Tibet. So we have to, one of my job is to make sure his holiness prepared us for this day. You know, he introduced democracy not even one year after coming into exile. Now 63 years down the line, we have elected leadership. We have local bodies. They are able to take care of themselves. Where is, wherever there's a sizable number of Tibetans, there are Tibetan associations. They organize weekend Tibetan classes, cultural programs. So there are uh, a lot of challenges. And if there are ways and means that the Australian government can help us financially on those developmental aids for education and uh, rehabilitation of Tibetans, it would be welcome. I've asked my representative also to reach out to the government and see whether there are possibilities. And I'm sure our friends in the parliament will also help us advise as to what can be done. On that note, I think it's very clear that there's a lot of goodwill for you and for the people of Tibet in this room and in Australia. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for your speech here and for taking the questions here. I know we were speaking earlier and your, your father came from Amdo, the same region of Tibet where the Dalai Lama is from, what was born. It's a long journey from Amdo to your upbringing in, in a refugee camp to Washington DC and now Canberra. So thank you for that journey here so we can hear. Uh, please join me in thanking Pempa Sering. Welcome back here at any point. Please, uh, Thank you. please come back. We'd Thank love you. to hear from you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.